In all the stories of the Bible, I do not believe we can find any more of a repulsive character than Ahab, or characters, plural, Ahab and Jezebel. If you turn to 1 Kings chapter 21, and you look at verses 25 and 26, you see inspiration describing this way Ahab. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. And he did very abominably in following idols, according in all things, as did the Ammonites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. This lets it be known very clearly, as is the case elsewhere in the Bible, that not only do we need to look to the marvelous, perfect example of Jesus or the great servants of God, such as the Apostle Paul, Moses, people like that from the Old Testament, to see good qualities in their character that we need to emulate. We also need to look at people like Ahab, and others in the Bible like him to see character traits that we don't want to have any part of us. We know there are persons who think that negative preaching, as it's come to be known, is wrong, but the Bible teaches otherwise. And one of the most apparent faults that Ahab had was covetousness. And I think that covetousness really is one of the most dangerous, insidious sins known to man. Now, we may think lying, or we may think fornication or adultery, something like that's bad, but when you really understand what it takes to be a covetous person as to why it is such a bad thing, now, here's what's amazing about that. In all my nearly 60 years of preaching, I've never heard one member of the church confess as they had sinned in the sin of covetousness. Now, you search your mind and see if you have. If you have, tell me about it when I'm through. I think that's one thing that uh, we don't realize. I've heard them confess every other sin, and rightly so, and so should we all, for we're taught that when we repent of sins. But I've never heard anybody confess covetousness. There is an interesting story in the old preacher biography of J.D. Tant. Tant died in about 1940, but he was something else from all that wrote about him. A lot of interesting things. I've talked to people that actually knew him. Even they have gone on now. But he said he was preaching out in Texas, and there was a very wealthy cattleman there. When the contribution was taken up, he dropped in 50 cents, which granted in those days a lot more than it would be here because we talked about probably 130 years ago. But when Tant saw it, he just simply pulled it out of the collection plate and gave it back to him and said, in view of how much you're worth and everybody knows it, you might as well keep this if that's all you're going to give. Well, I can think of how that would cause the church house to fall in. But nevertheless, that says something. That says something about what we think when it comes to what covetousness is, how insidious it is. Now, there's a reason for this, and it's found in the very definition. It is an inordinate desire for something. And or doesn't mean it's a desire that is unlawful. We shouldn't want it that much. We shouldn't want it to the point where we're willing to do all sorts of things to get it. And yet, to be a covetous person, that has to be a character trait. The word is sometimes used to signify a wrong desire without the implications of evil. Paul says, covet earnestly the best gifts and speaking of miraculous gifts during that age of the first century 1 Corinthians 12 31 I've told people at times I covet their prayers that's the 
strong, strong desire for you to pray for me. And this word is zilu, not epithumia, the usual word for covet. But in both the Koine Greek and the English word, covet, epithumia, we can see that there is a neutral or good sense as when Jesus said, I have desired, that's the Greek word epithumia, to eat this Passover with you, Luke twenty two fifteen. Now, how do we know the difference? Well, the context. The literary environment that particular word finds itself in usually shows us whether the desire is a right desire, as we've read some scriptures here that teach that, covet earnestly the best gifts, or whether it is a sinful desire. Paul says in his letter to the Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5 that covetousness is idolatry. Now that begins to tell us something. This is the word pleonexia. And it simply means the desire to have more. If you're governed by the desire to have more, it'll slip up on you. It'll begin to ease into your whole estimate of things and how you view things and material things in particular. And that word, by the way, is always used in a bad sense. Thus, it describes one of the great terrible traits of Ahab. This is improper desire for money, the improper desire for power, the proper improper desire for anything if it causes us to break God's will or even to leave undone things God obligates us to do. And the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So love, loving things and even a proper love of money is nothing wrong with it. But you can have an evil desire to have money, an evil desire to have this, that, or the other of this world and it will begin to govern how you serve God how you estimate things and how you look on life and I think some people are so involved in it they don't realize that it's always been a very interesting thing to me that Peter and John going up to the temple when the lame man saw them he thought he was fixed to give them something money we'd say he says alms there but that's what he meant but then Peter said, silver and gold, how have I none? But such as I have, give I unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. In my years of working with a great many people in the church, it seems like that they thought if we did not have money, we cannot be faithful. Well, if that's so, Peter and John lied through their teeth and inspiration recorded. We know better than that. Sometimes we think if we don't have things, we can't faithfully serve God. And yet the Lord says, if you serve me with the whole heart, putting me first, you'll have what you need. That's a matter of trusting, getting it in God's way and what ought to come first. And too many of us put the affairs of this present world and the accumulation of things first rather than to serve God first and let him take care of us because he knows better how to take care of me than I do. There are some ways that we can tell for sure whether we are covetous or whether we're not. If the prosperity of somebody else pains us, the chances are that uh, we're not only envious, but we're covetous. If you desire for yourself what somebody else has, even if it means that you're getting it, deprives him of it, certainly you're a covetous person. If we're never satisfied, no matter how much we have, we're more likely covetous. It's interesting that Paul said, I've learned to be content. He never did say satisfied. I, I, I'll never be satisfied until I'm in heaven. I hope no Christian is ever satisfied that they're in heaven because it may mean they're going the other direction. Learn to be content. Well, if you look at the context there, Paul says, I've learned to have a lot. I've learned to have nothing. 
Because he, he understood life in the flesh. It's all fleeting anyway. It's all going to be gone someday. Your body, it's all going to be gone. Everything material will be done away. So what's going to be left? The unseen, the spirit. Thus we're taught to lay up treasures in heaven. Well, how do you do that? Faithfully serving God here. Which means we seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness first. And then he says, and all these things shall be added unto you, Matthew 6, 33. He's talking about that very thing and how to not be a covetous person. The important lesson on covetousness is one that we need to learn. I don't think we can start too, too early because if you really want to see some covetousness, watch how kids at 2, 3, 4, 5 are. If they want what their playmate has, they'll take it. And they'll be very upset if you make them give that back to them. I've seen little children playing in a sandbox or someplace like that and try to take something away from the other one. And there'd be a bit of a tug of war start. And then maybe one or the other would just knock the other one in the head. Well, that, you know, that has to be curbed as they grow up. And thus, when you see our society today, you see some of that has never been curbed. You see that the tempers that they, tantrums that they threw when they were little and given into all their life, never taught to control themselves. You see then when they grow older, it displays itself in adult relations. I was watching one of these court things I mentioned to you a while ago. I do watch from time to time on YouTube. And... uh, this woman was being talked to by the judge. There was no more respect on her part for that judge than would be a cockroach. And he said to her, listen to me and don't interrupt me while I'm talking to you in this court. And she said, well, why don't you listen to me and be quiet while I'm talking? Well, I couldn't conceive of that. But it's regular nowadays and everything. Just look around you. And you can witness it personally almost. Just spend a little while out in the public. And you see very quickly how it works. The whole thing about Christianity is denying self. And that's not an easy easy thing for us to do sometimes. Maybe easier in some areas than than others. But covetousness means it's me. And uh, I want that. And I'm going to have it. So the lesson shows what can happen when a person makes himself or herself a slave to his circumstances. And we're slaves to circumstances when we allow things and circumstances to control our plans, our purposes, our thinking, our happiness. And the consequences then are rarely good. They are most of the time bad. And this is one reason Paul's attitude is so important as inspiration had him express it to the church in Philippi. Philippians 4.11 is such a valuable thing. And I've already referred to it. I'd suggest it be a motto we ought to put on a placard and put somewhere. And I'm only emphasizing what I mentioned a while ago by saying it again. I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. That's a mouthful. That says a lot. Well, when do we learn that lesson? Are you ever discontented? (laughs) How do we learn to be content in whatsoever state we find ourselves while there are people who strive after it and some who gain money and power and possessions and fame and even some people have good looks success in various ways but you know those things alone is not going to give anyone contentment they're not going to do it the Bible tries to tell us that we have many examples in the Bible negative examples not to be that way we all, if we know history, we know that Alexander the Great had the whole Medo-Persian Empire and far more. He conquered the world as it was known then and the time he was 33 years old. But he, but he was not at peace. He was not at rest. And he supposedly sat down on the ranks of river and no more place to conquer. And this is why the statement of Solomon in Proverbs 16 in verse 2 is so valuable. And it reads, He who rules his own heart is better than he that taketh a city. 
If one gets the idea that his present car or house or part of town or clothing is not big or glamorous enough, he'll discover all sorts of things that are wrong with any of those things that he never thought about before because he's determined he's going to have something and he can find everything wrong with whatever it is he's trying to switch out. There's so many things like that that are so rudimentary that they become a part of us and we don't even catch it in the way we reason out things or view things or think about things. We ought to learn to live in such a way that our happiness is not controlled by external circumstances. If you can do that, you have uh, done a great deal. You've grown a lot. Your character's more in the likeness of Christ. Now think about Christ, how he had to live flawlessly in that way to be able to be sinless. That all the external circumstances around him did not impress him. Remember he said the foxes of the have their dens, birds have their nests. But what about me? Son of man hath not where to lay his head. That didn't seem to bother him. Didn't seem to bother him at all. And remember, he's as human as you are and I am. Why was he able to do that? Because the Spirit ruled him. That is, the spiritual things and doing God's will ruled him. So the question is, how do we get to that stage? How do we do that? How do we work on it? Well, the first place is where it all begins. We must be aware of the truth about it. We must know God's warnings and examples in the Bible. We must be honest with our own personal experiences to show the importance of finding happiness in spite of adverse circumstances. That doesn't mean when you're hurting because you have something that's inflicted a wound on you or some sort of illness that you are sinning if you feel bad. It doesn't mean that at all. It never has meant that. It just means that you know that's all part and parcel of this life and that you take it in stride or you try to. You have to learn those things. You know, we joke around here. Some of us aren't joking when we say we're old now. <laughs> well, you know, it's like David said, I've been young and now I'm old. <laughs> A young person cannot say anything but that I've been young. They're going to have to wait a while if they live long enough to where they can say, I've been young and now I'm old. Now, one of the things is that you have to learn these things. I firmly believe and have thought so a long time ago that some parts of the Bible concerning how we're to live don't become quite so clear to us until we've lived life for a while. And we see some of the things that we didn't see because we had not lived life. And there are things that tempt you when you're a young person. It won't tempt you when you get older. But when you get older, lo and behold, you find out there are those things there that didn't tempt you while we were younger. As long as you're possession of your faculties, the devil's going to tempt you if he can. That's the first thing. Be aware of the truth about it. The next thing is let your mind and soul be controlled, be motivated and directed by spiritual values. Well, what's that? There's nothing uh, strange about it. It's just what the Bible says you ought to care about. Care about those things God says you ought to care about. Be concerned about them. Seek to discharge your duties to God. These are the things that really matter. This is how you form your character. This is how you are in the likeness of Christ. This is how you get ready for heaven. There's not any other way. Begins with the truth. And then you're determined to be concerned about spiritual values. These things are far more important than the external situations and circumstances. and They become, the older you get, more insignificant. Now, let me give you an example of one of, the, of these things. And this is not just because we had a marriage here yesterday because I've had this uh, sermon around a lot longer than that. <laughs> this example is that if you're going to get married, you've got you to gotta start where your parents are when they've been at it for 30, 40 years. 
I've seen people think, so they got out of high school, well, if I could get this, 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 well, how long did it take folks to get some of those things? How long did it take them to work toward it, to get educated, to apply themselves, to be willing to wait and to use their time as they ought to? If you think you're going to have a big house and all that stuff, uh, and, and people go into debt head over heels in order to get it, and they stay that way, you're going to discover, that if that's the case, that when you get that big house, you're still not going to be happy. It's not going to make happiness. All those, you know this little hovel that a person's in right now? Won't burn any faster at the end of the world than Buckingham Palace. <laughs> it's all going to go. We can make up our minds that happiness in marriage doesn't depend on the size of the house. And when you do that, you begin to look at everything else in the proper perspective, or you ought to. And there'll be a lot of things that just won't, you know, Lord, you won't have the old saying, keeping up the Joneses, I've got to have this, I've got to have that, because somebody has it. And you'll see that in children that are growing up. Well, somebody else does it. Somebody else has it. Why can't I? Well, you have to learn. And that's what life's all about, is learning. Think about that. Being like Christ on earth is learning. Learning the truth then learning how it affects the circumstances where you are. You can make up your mind that happiness in marriage does not depend on the size of the house or anything like that. That's just an example. These things are a result of a choice of will. I have to learn then how to exercise my will to choose the right things. I know we can set our mind on certain things because we're told in Colossians 3, 1 through 2. And Paul gives us a list of things to think on in Philippians 4 and verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things, look where he begins, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honorable, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, Whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Now, I want you sometime when you have time to sit down and think about the true, the honorable, the just, the pure, the lovely. And none of them have a thing the world do with material things. None of them. They all have their root in the truth of God and what life is all about in this world. It's to get ready for the next. Most of us don't understand that. The world certainly doesn't. The result of thinking on these things that Paul lists here will bring happiness and serenity. For if you think on these things, you cannot think on other things that cause frustration and anxiety. I promise you, out of experience and from the teaching of Holy Writ, that if people who are bothered about everything and they're always in a frizz and a flip and a tizzy or whatever you want to call it, frustrated and anxious, they don't get that way from thinking on the things Paul says think on. You just don't. You can't. How can you get all frustrated over thinking about what's true and honorable and just and pure and lovely? How do you do that? You can't. The other things, the things that pertain to this life. One result of living for self is that one, watch it, one gets tired of him or herself. When a person gets full of himself, he may have an allergy to himself. He's self-centered, he's wrapped up in himself. And watch this. He has no place to go to get away. I've seen this all along and told it to several people. When you see some so-called, they think they're Christians, and they're upset at the way things are going in the congregation. And they don't know you're upset because you. I told a fellow years ago, he, was, he didn't appreciate it much, but this was a long time ago. We were on the phone, and he was complaining about something. I don't know what it was. But I said, uh, you want to know where the problem is? you have any mirrors in your house? 
Well, he got the message pretty quick, and that even frustrated him more. Well, that's the way it is. That, that goes as much for me as it does you. But I told some brethren sometimes, and they get all frustrated. To go. I said, you know, you're taking yourself with you, and you're going to find out there's why you, that's why you've got the problem. It's right there. The Lord had no problems like that. Why? Because he knew the proper concept of self and his relationship to this world and what ought to be put first. And he worked on it, I guess is the best way to put it. In Galatians 5, verse 24, Paul wrote, They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. That's easy to read through awful fast. Or to have it read to us from the pulpit or in class and not realize what's being said there. Notice it involves the will of each person that does it. I have to will to concentrate on the things the Lord says I ought to concentrate on and recognize the difference in those and what does take up my thinking. In Romans 6, 6, he says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. That's what we're doing. We're living a life on the, by the direction of God. The dangers of these undisciplined desires are universal. And they're not confined to the rich, whatever rich means. They apply to any kind of desire, whether or not we call it coveting. It's that over-desire for things that are passing of this present world. The natural desires, certainly, of our fleshly body are God-given. They're right, but they're guided by the Word of God keeps us in the proper relationship to the affairs of this world because we're just passing through. We're pilgrims. Undisciplined and undirected by the Lord, every time they'll lead to sin, the transgression of God's law. Eve's desire for food was God-given. Her desire to have things that delight the eye was not necessarily wrong within itself. Her wish to be wise within itself was not a sin. When they became undisciplined and undirected by the word of God, they led to transgressing God's will. They led to sin. We can see, I think, that these things show us that material things alone don't bring happiness. But in being certain kinds of persons brings happiness when we set our affections on things above and not on things on the earth. When God promises the God of peace shall be with you, as Paul wrote Philippians 4, 9, the peace of God doesn't pass away as we abide in the truth. And that's where we began. And I don't know where to begin or end except with the truth. Because that sanctifies us. As the Lord prayed, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So when you go back and you read about characters like Ahab in the Old Testament, you realize they're not just recording history. They're recording people who chose the wrong thing when they could have done otherwise. They chose to think on things and plan and seek things in the wrong way. And they turned into what they turned into. If you're not a Christian this afternoon, we urge you to believe that Christ is the Son of God and believe with all your heart that He is. That you will repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. If you don't do that, you're lost and you'll remain lost. And you don't know before you reach home today if you'll ever reach home. And you'll be ushered into eternity unprepared to meet God. As a child of God, then we are expected in the church, covered by the blood of Christ, walking in the faith, to recognize such things as we've talked about and to learn to be content in whatsoever state we're in by putting the truth of God first and the lessons like this one to keep us in the proper relationship, not only with things outside us, but even with ourselves. So the question we must ask ourselves, do I know how to treat myself like God wants me to treat myself. Just ask yourself that question. If there's a child of God here that's sinned and needs to repent and 
you need to confess them and pray God for forgiveness. Now's the time to do that. Or anyone that needs to obey the gospel, won't you come then while we stand and sing?